Well, I should start straight then. <laughs> posture, posture, posture. Well, here we are. Hopefully, with only five more weeks <laughs> of winter left, in, in, <laughs> in late February 2009 at the 1812 Museum, thanks to Keith Herkelo, president of the association, we, we've used this space a lot lately. It's a good space. That's what it's for. And we've loved this space. Keith, as our viewers might or might not know, is the city clerk. He's also president of the Battle of Plattsburgh Association and... Uh, for an amateur historian, he's got his finger on the pulse. Really? There's so many things. <laughs> and it's bleeding, right? And the reason we're all here today is to talk about Dr. William Beaumont, and Keith knows a lot about this Beaumont Walk, which is right under the Oval in Plattsburgh Air Force Base. We're going to talk about that. Jim Dawson, distinguished professor from Plattsburgh State, <laughs> member of the New York State Board of Regents and dear friend for many years, so interested in local history. Jim, great to see you. My pleasure. Dr. John Southwick, part of the rodeo gang, retired old doctor's eat out. John and I have been through a few <laughs> trenches together. <Yes. laughs> We've certainly had some conversations that uh, some of which are repeatable on television. <laughs> and as as his wife told him when he came here today, it's a good thing Gordy's there to keep you from rambling. And my wife said it's a good thing John's going to be there to keep you from rambling. So I don't know. We all may ramble a little bit. Of course, bit. my wife also said, don't mention my name. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we made sure we mentioned her name right off the bat. <laughs> Otherwise known no as name. the wife. Uh, yeah, also, yeah, I was a little woman, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're on a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and all of us in this room have done some thinking about this man over the years. Uh, Jim, you've had a special interest in Dr. Beaumont, haven't you? Yes, well, when I came to the college, Beaumont Hall was just being completed. It, the name had already been granted, but there'd never been a dedication. And uh, over a period of years, uh, chemistry, biology, and psychology, I guess, moved into that building. And those of us who were in Hudson Hall, the original, you know, the earlier science building, got to expand our offices a little bit. So, yes, I was delighted to see uh, Beaumont Hall expand. I had read the book about, or one of the books about Beaumont when I was in high school, so I knew who he no, was. Oh, you did? Really? Yeah. Uh, there is, actually is a... a a student version, if you will, of his biography available, and there was it at that time, and uh, so I knew who he was, and uh, so I was interested, and um, Gene Link was interested, and uh, ultimately, actually, it was uh, the dean at the time was Charlie Warren, who later became campus oh. president, uh, was what interested, a guy. and uh, we organized a dedication for the building in uh, 1985. A little bit late, but nonetheless, we got it done. 1985. <laughs> 25, big, almost 25 years ago, yes. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. Where does the time go? <laughs> We're all just so young around this table. That's amazing. Yeah. So you've read a lot of stuff. You've got, as a matter of fact, you've got a copy of... of uh, I have Beaumont's a reprint. Book, a reprint. I have a reprint, and as part of the uh, dedication of the building, Gene Link, who was uh, just retired as a professor of history, had a an original of the book that that he, that the Beaumont wrote, uh, at one of the first editions published in Plattsburgh, eight, uh, 1833, and I guess when he got the book, and I think he paid six hundred dollars for this book, uh, it was it it was uh, kind of in tough shape, and uh, he found some um, brothers, I guess they were in Vermont, who uh, were able to restore the book, wow. and as a part of the dedication. Um, uh, Gene Link uh, gave a, a short talk about Beaumont and um, uh, presented the book to Special Collections and where it sits today. Wonderful. Yep. Mm -hmm. Where everybody has an interest in this, and I'm I'm what they call a I have peripheral in interest. Uh, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a historian, but I'm interested in what all of you people do. John's a retired medical doctor, and so you got to be interested in this whole study all by itself, huh? Don't you wish you could go back in a time machine 
and see what this guy did putting his hands in the stomach and tasting it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he did. To see how yes, acidic it was. He, was. Yes, he really yes, did that for yes. years. No wonder he, he died young. People, he got other people to do the same thing. The taste test. Mm -hmm. Alexis <laughs> St. Martin is the story. We're, we're going to, before we finish, we hope we can tell the whole story about Dr. Beaumont, wow. his connection with the Battle of Plattsburgh and this area as a, an army surgeon. His family uh, came here, moved actually into the colonies in the early 1600s. They were up in Champlain for a long time. Mm. And two years. Yeah. You know, that's time. interesting because in high school, I don't ever remember being told this or taught anything. And there's a nice big plaque outside of my physician's house named Dr. George Allen. And oh, it's there. that's where it is. Now we know. And... Uh, uh, but I don't ever remember anybody making any mention of the fact that he's taught school for two years there. That happens so often. And his uncle, his history. uncle was a supervisor, and I guess that's part of the reason he came to Champlain. And a brother, too, but his uncle mm -hmm. was a supervisor, first to Champlain and then to Moore's. Isn't that incredible? We were mentioning early where all the plaques are. <clears throat> Keith told me the plaque down on, on uh, Bridge Street... Is inside it, it building. moved inside. I've been telling people for years, there's a plaque right on that building. And they've and been I'm saying surprised. that, Gordy Little. Well, he, always <laughs> about we, tried, we tried to buy that. The Medical Society, oh, when really? I was president back in 1974, 75, we went down to the owner at that time, I think it was Zachary's. Yeah. Yep. And we asked if they would sell it to us. Mm -hmm. He said, no, it's part of the building. Well, I guess somebody did some mischief there, and they took it off, and it's upstairs somewhere in the building. It's no longer on the corner, I don't think. Hmm. I don't think it's still there. I think it's inside the building, hidden somewhere. Well, our, well, viewer, well, our viewers can go and find out where that plaque is. That, we that's were, your job. If the last just... time we went there, he wouldn't show it to us, but told us it was oh. in the building. <laughs> and we were willing to buy it. Well, the building, of course, is the site of uh, Dr. Bobot's office. Yes. So that, yeah. it, you know, the and large... That's why the, the plaque was there in the thing. first yeah. place. Yeah. In fact, I think that's what it says on the plaque, if I'm not... Yeah. yeah. We got so much yeah. to talk about. Stay with us, folks. Yeah. We're going to have a great session here. So... Well, there's this picture. So far as we know, Jim, there was not a photograph taken of him, even though... I've uh, never seen a photograph, and it would have been a daguerreotype, because he died in uh, 1853. Three, I guess it was. Yes. Uh, so we don't. We we do have um, photographs of the patient, Alexis St. Martin, and the real story, of course, about Beaumont is the fact that in 1822, this uh, French Canadian, uh, uh, really a, a, a person of, of not not very good means, uh, happened to be up in Michilimackinac and accidentally got shot in the stomach, and it was a very serious wound. And uh, Dr. Beaumont actually saved his life uh, by doing numerous surgeries. Uh, the wound was uh, in the stomach primarily, but it broke several ribs and left uh, bits and pieces of gun wadding and, and bullet fragments, et cetera, in him. And these began to abscess. And it really took nearly two years before uh, the patient uh, was um, more or less cured. In the curing process, it left a, a fistula or an opening into the uh, uh, Alexis St. John's stomach. And over the next 10 or so years, Dr. Beaumont studied the digestion process by being able to open up and, and look in at food as it was uh, being processed by, the, by this poor man's stomach. Process of putrefication, it was called. Well, that's, yes, that's well, what that's they what thought they called. initially. Yeah. They yeah. thought the stomach was just a pouch you bet. where food went and kind of stirred around a little bit and putrefied, and then they didn't even, sus well, I guess they suspected but didn't prove until Dr. Beaumont showed mm -hmm. that there was an acid, and then later on there's another substance called Pepsi. But he it's tested. a miracle that this guy, and his, <laughs> his name was Alexis St. Martin, right? That's right. And uh, it's a miracle that he lived as long as he did Absolutely. because this yes. guy, and, and uh, we're going to tell part of the story because Calvin wrote a little background in this Town of Champlain book. But I mean, the doctor would take a, a string on a piece of silk and mm -hmm. put a piece of chicken in there, a piece yeah, of, he did a several piece of yep. roast mm -hmm. beef, and see how to long it would take. Or to, to digest each piece. And, and he then had he beef, would. He had pork, he had vegetables, he had. The everything. whole thing. Yep. Then he would take the, the, the gastric juices and put it in a test tube, right. mm -hmm. put the, the same, same beef, and yep. see how long it took outside. Exactly. The, 
Anyway, yep. people are saying, what are they talking about? <laughs> We've never heard of Dr. Beaumont in our lives. Well, amazingly <laughs> enough, he, for the time, he actually published the work in a book. And it was a substantial book published right here in Plattsburgh in yep. 1833 that described these 10 years or so of experiments. And that book... O off and on. Right? Uh, off and on, yes. And uh, there, were, you were, there was a certain amount of tension between uh, Alexis oh, St. John yeah. and Dr. Beaumont. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the Saint Martin, Saint yes, Martin, I like yeah. to Saint Martin. Uh, but the uh, the the book uh, really circulated widely in medical circles, and yet it was published by really a newspaper man in Plattsburgh who himself was not well known as a publisher at all. He was and the um, the uh, publisher of the local paper. Yes, exactly, yeah. Plattsburgh Republican right. mm -hmm. in those days. Isn't that great? Let me read a little background while everybody catches their breath here as if we needed to. <laughs> <laughs> These are some of the best ratchet jaws on the face ratchet of the earth. Right jaws? Here. Don't you love it? I That's love what it. my wife calls me all the time. Faculty love, love to talk. You know? Oh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a rich subject at the very least. Here it is. And once again, this is a book which is still available, probably in much better shape than this <laughs> right here. <laughs> a book that's seven, seven years old, Calvin? Yep. Yeah, seven years old, Town of Champlain, Town 2000. 80, about 80 years, 80 old. Years, oh, years old. This one looks like it's been through the washing machine and the dryer. One of the things that you know are going to happen when you put together a book of this nature, Calvin says, is the inevitable complaint from the public saying, why didn't you include... Whatever. I know that as soon as we go to print, I'm going to thank a handful of people in places that should have been highlighted within these pages. <laughs> in fact, he says, if not for a recent conversation with County Clerk John Zerlo, who surely would have neglected to include the renowned Dr. William Beaumont. He certainly deserves recognition, although he wasn't native born and his fame was earned after he left the area. Dr. Beaumont's family came from England to the colonies, as I said earlier, 1635. His father and paternal uncles all fought in the Revolutionary War. That's significant. Following the war, his father Samuel became a farmer over in Lebanon, Connecticut. Two of his brothers, William and Daniel, then moved up to Champlain. And now, little is known about any of those previous. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Dr. Beaumont was the second of nine children born to Samuel and Lucretia, born in Lebanon. November 21st, 1785, 22 years later in 1807, moved to Champlain to become the town's first schoolmaster, as we said, serving from 1807 to 1810. In 1809, began his studies to become a doctor. By reading, this is the process that you had to go through back then, by reading under Not Dr. Either. Benjamin Moore, I don't know, maybe John... <laughs> No, he went. To, he went to school. He, anyway, he did it reading. So. It says so. It says so. That's right. Doctor Benjamin Moore of Champlain. Anyway, his That's apprenticeship great. was served starting in early 1811 under Doctor Benjamin Chandler and Doctor Truman Powell over in St. Albans. He was approved to practice medicine in June of 1812. A significant year. A significant year. History with very few medical books in the U.S. at this point in our history, this method of training was certainly not very uncommon. Dr. William Beaumont joined the Army, the U.S. Army, of course, September 13th, 1812, as a surgeon's mate, was assigned to the 6th Infantry Regiment in Plattsburgh, served until June of 1815. One can only imagine the volume of medical experience he gained during this tumultuous period known to us is the War of 1812. You betcha. Boy. After settling in Plattsburgh following the war, Beaumont rejoined the Army in December 1819 as a post-surgeon. He was assigned to Fort Mackinac, right? Mm -hmm. That is how you say it, isn't it, mm -hmm. Jim? Mackinac, yeah. 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 On a small island in Lake Michigan, June 6, 1822. Here's the story. As Jim has uh, so ably told us, French-Canadian Alexis St. Martin shot. It was, a, it, it, was an a, it was an accident. It was an accident. It was an accident. Yeah. And so it was an open gastric fistula. Mm -hmm. Right, John? Actually, he got shot and it, it punctured a lung, yep. fractured ribs, and mm -hmm. then also penetrated the stomach. And like he said, uh, mm -hmm. he had spent hours and hours debriding that using medical uh, uh, constituents back then to help get rid of the dead tissue or dying tissue and then physically removing it with no anesthesia. Mm -hmm. 
So he was hurting when Dr. Beaumont was digging that stuff out of him, but he saved his life, as you said. And kept mm -hmm. him as a handy man, yeah, right? Well, the guy that was, was part, well. That was part of it. He was uh, uh, not able... Beaumont didn't get much uh, financial aid from the community to help with this man who was destitute. He didn't have any income. He was working as a fur trader, a labor pe laborman, but he didn't have any income. So Beaumont said, okay, come work when he got better. Come work for us and do some housework and stuff, and we'll continue our experiments while you're here and continue treating you. The only way he could you. keep him. Right? The mm -hmm. only way he could keep him available. Right. right. That's amazing. Actually, they got together, what, two or three different times mm -hmm. over yeah, the course of their lives. Yeah, they hoped to do it again. Would run away. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. He went, he he went to Canada. Canada. <laughs> he went to Left Canada. the country. He Canada. wanted a woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, ultima he ultimately, he did get yeah. married and had a family. Right. 17 yep. kids. Yep. 17, 17 kids, and he, he long outlived yes. the doctor yeah. that that's saved right. his life. And this That's why... In this little piece that I downloaded from the internet, uh, Beaumont was called the father of gastric physiology. You can understand why. Nobody before or since has done mm -hmm. <laughs> this kind of a thing, have they, John? Well, they have, but yeah. I don't think it's been publicized as much because he was the, he was the first. pioneer, you know, yeah. in doing this. Well, th anyway, there's a, a lot of information about it. That's why we're gathered here to talk about it because, as Calvin says in the beginning, Gordy, you must realize there are people watching this show now right now who never heard of Dr. Mm -hmm. William Beaumont. It grieves Keith and I to think that there are people watching this show who never heard of the, the War of 1812 That's Museum. True. That's true. Who Come never, and visit. Who never heard of the Kent DeLorde House. Who never heard of Henry DeLorde. Well, mm -hmm. so... Henri. Mm -hmm. So our, part of our mission, and we're all involved in this gym, especially at his level, is to perpetuate this history, to let people know where we came from. Well, thank goodness there's there's been over the last 20 years an initiative in the education department to foster local history mm -hmm. in the education system. And prior to that, it was as you said, yeah. Doc, it was disregarded. Mm -hmm. People weren't taught what Even happened in, in their Champlain, own backyard. As I said, there's a nice plaque. It's always been there. Surely. And a lot of people, like you said, Gordy, in our little village, don't know who Dr. Beaumont yeah. was, or don't even probably don't even know his first name. Exactly. Might have yeah. had mm -hmm. remembered his last name, but. And almost all the Beaumonts were either Samuel or William. Yes, that's <laughs> true. That's, his, that's true. His cousin helped him in the experiments uh, mm -hmm. later on, Samuel. So, Jim, that's yeah. got to please you that this is now, that history, the local history, is a big part of the curriculum now. We're delighted. Uh, it, it, it's taken off on a statewide basis, and uh, virtually every community now is, is engaged, particularly in the fourth grade, but also in other years, uh, in, in a wide variety of projects, our uh, Archives Partnership Trust gives a series of awards every year to uh, at various grade levels to for, for projects. We've had winners from the North Country, uh, and it's it, the the amount of interest is is um, just amazing. And New York, as I think everyone understands, it was one of the first of the uh, you know was, was one of the thirteen colonies and uh, very important colony, and we have an enormous history. When you begin to, to look at that history, uh, it, it crosses into every, every arena. In the, um, in the old medical library in the State Education Building, uh, there's a mural uh, dedicated to four very famous doctors in history. And the one from New York that's represented is William Beaumont. See, I didn't know that till Jim told us that before the camera started mm -hmm. today. Well, one of the one of the items in the in the state education package now is as DBQ is the, the right. term document based questions, yep. and isn't uh, that neat? In as part of the regents package uh, for the grade four five and I believe nine, mm -hmm. uh, the local history component, and it it says that essentially to the to the teachers out there, take your students and go back to the original documents. You know, there are plenty of copies available. Here's where they are. Go find them and base your, your lesson plans on the original documents, not based on opinion that's been filtered Keith, over the Keith years and years. Keith loves this because that's, that's what his life is all you know, about. That's what we have in our documents. business now, too, is evidence-based research. Evidence-based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. don't go by the seat of your pants and say, well, this is what they did. Maybe we should have done this way. I'm going to do it this way. So my experience says this. You don't do that anymore. Reality works except on TV. 
<laughs> reality shows are really strange, but reality in the education process, you learn what you're taught, but you appreciate what you experience. There, there's a good quote, and I don't know who said it. Jim, do you know what happened to uh, Eugene Link's copy? Because he's passed yes, on, hasn't he? Uh, he has, yeah. and the copy is still in special collections, as far as I know. That was where it was presented, and it's now owned by the college. I was suggesting that uh, maybe we could get a film clip of it and, and work it into the program somehow. I That's think it would good. be easy to do. Yeah. Talk about film clips. Yeah. Film Look clips. what Calvin found. <laughs> How many people remember Richard Boone? Oh, Have boy. Gun Will Travel. Have Never mind that. Travel. We're talking about his great show called Medic. And Calvin, who scours the Internet for interesting things, has found a copy of Richard Boone My. with guest star Charles Bronson as Alexis St. Martin, right? And maybe if we if we leave you enough time, <laughs> he'll put this on, on the end. I have seen several, uh, um, at least public television specials on, on Dr. Beaumont. I think there might have been one or two full-length movies based on his life, and especially on this part of it. Uh, but I didn't have time, nor did I... Uh, have the energy after my third cup of coffee this morning to look it up. But before we uh, go any farther, I want to mention something about Keith and, and this hallowed ground that we hallowed, sit on hello, hello. on the former Plattsburgh <laughs> Air Force Base where we now have a wonderful museum campus of three great museums growing all True. the time, working very hard to survive. But I started doing some ghost tours by bus with Keith a couple of years ago. Wonderful stuff. And he T started telling me about this Beaumont path. Path. Beaumont pathway. And, you, you know, probably won't be able to see the map. I didn't know about it until Keith told me, but we have a map. And Is it right there? Yep. yep. We, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank goodness we did something right here, Jim. And this, if it's hard to see, but this is Route 9, and this is the Oval. This is where we're at over here in this location. Beaumont pathway went from uh, Burn what is Lane. now, look, look, no, it's uh, Burn, Drive. Burn Drive. It was yep. changed. The, the corner of Burn and Lucretia Marie Davidson Way. Oh, right. my that's goodness. Right. Yeah. Come on. And the, the poet. Th sure. That's oh, correct. Yeah. Uh, and that was thanks to uh, to a former council person no here kidding. in Plattsburgh. Yeah. Uh, it goes from that. To, it's, the, it's the entrance to the old base across from what was Fort Brown. You can still see that there. There's a marker. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it goes across to what was the old hospital building, which is building 44, for those of you who are in the Air Force and remember the building numbers by heart. So many of you do, which is really bizarre. Yeah, that's right. uh, this is known as 652, and people yeah, say, oh, it's beyond me. that's I 652, yeah. and it's bizarre. But they remember them by the numbers. And it was called Beaumont Path, and it, or Beaumont Walk, excuse me. And does it say walk on here? Yes, it does. Nope, it says Pathway. I'm sorry. Okay. It's Beaumont Pathway, and it went from that location, which used to be uh, a gate for the, the military, although in, in uh, the latter part of the, the um, old base, they kept it closed. Uh, but it used to be the, the exit to go downtown uh, from the old base, and it went straight across to what was the old base hospital, Building 44. And here, it doesn't exist anymore, but many people don't even know that it was there. Isn't that amazing? And it, I have no idea. Was it paid? No, it wasn't paid. It wasn't paid. It was a walkway. It was a walkway. A walkway. And mm -hmm. you don't, don't, come, don't plan to come to the former base and see mm -hmm. it there. No, it's, it's because soccer it, fields. But soccer but it's, fields it's right underneath there. the base oval yep. and would have come out uh, similar to where the old flagpole was. Right near there somewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. Yes, it's close to that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Not, not the the original one. The yeah. the original one was by the other entrance. Right. That was built by our one armed friend. Yep. Uh, but where the the flags are right now, yep. the building immediately to if you were to be standing there with your back to the the old headquarters building, uh, it would be just a little bit to the right of it and uh, on the lake side. Second building in. You know, Jim told me that because Alexis St. Martin lived to a ripe old age, he was well into the age of photography. Yes. Photography was, uh, was well established for many, many years by the time he died. And you said there is an extant photograph. Oh, yes, there are photographs of uh, both Alexis St. Martin and his wife. 
Yes. No kidding. I've yeah. never never seen those. I wish I had known that. I would have brought one. Some with us today. some years ago, one of the medical societies in Canada uh, uh, put up an, a, a plaque uh, commemorating his gravesite. You know, when he when he died, the family was concerned that the uh, the medical community would want to uh, exhume his stomach <laughs> and, uh, and 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 pickle it. And, uh, and, oh, yeah, yeah, et cetera, oh et you know, this and, was a legitimate. And, 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 yes, and and and, 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 and you know, and, and, and obviously we, we do donate uh, body parts and, and and bodies to medicine for research, uh, and they were concerned, so they actually let the. Um, the body putrefied, to use one of your words, for a number uh, of days, for, for several days, uh, to make sure that uh, there wasn't <laughs> can enough. You, can uh, you? Uh, and then they then they buried him in an unmarked grave and put so, stones all over right, the top of it. Good yeah. thing, right? Covered and, it up. And, yeah. And and, um, and it was only uh, fairly recently uh, that uh, the med the Canadian medical community wanted to commemorate uh, the importance of, of of his participation in these experiments. That they went up and put a plaque. I think it says something like "near nearby lie the remains of" kind yeah. kind of thing. When um, when we de dedicated That's Beaumont great. Hall, um, I happened to be president at that time of the Clinton County Historical Association, and oh, we got the. Right. Um, I forgot to. Well, nothing to forget, but we, we got the Clinton County Historical Association together with the uh, Clinton County Medical Society. And the Chitten, Chittenden County Medical Society in in Vermont, and the um, the Medical Alumni Association of the University of Vermont, and our state university in Plattsburgh, because we were dedicating Beaumont Hall, and we held a two day symposium, and we had uh, four speakers uh, at at the uh, on the first day in Vermont, and then on the second day we had uh, three more speakers here in Plattsburgh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we we uh, and as as part of that, as I mentioned earlier, as part of that uh, dedication process, uh, Gene Link uh, gave the university this restored copy of the original the, the original book, the original book published in Plattsburgh, not the later edition that was published uh, a decade or so later in Burlington, Vermont, which is not as rare, uh, and. Uh, we took the uh, the papers from all, all but one of the papers from the uh, uh, conference, and we published them in a proceedings, which uh, for many years was available from the uh, Clinton County Historical Society. I don't know if the association. Don't know if there are any more left? I, I don't know if the association has any more uh, now or not, but they were selling them at a very modest price. And uh, Gene Link's uh, article, or his at least the the comments that he made when he presented the book, are included in here. Along with uh, Mayor Carlton Raynell's uh, de dedication oh, of yes. uh, uh, William Beaumont Day and here in Plattsburgh, and and the other more technical papers uh, from the conference. Well, it's interesting that it's tied with uh, with Vermont because Beaumont studied in Vermont originally mm -hmm. uh, under a doctor there. I can't remember his name. It was at St Albans. Yeah, mm -hmm. Chandler. Chandler. Benjamin. Chandler. There, there. Chandler and Truman Powell. Yeah, most biographies yeah. give give uh, Dr. Chandler the credit for. Uh, 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 advancing him to, uh, in fact, in fact, his his uh, first uh, medical uh, uh, certification is was in Vermont. And in the War of 1812, the major hospital under that wonderful Dr. Mann was actually in two places. It was here in Plattsburgh mm -hmm. and in Burlington. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beaumont was back and forth. And you know the the uh, contonement here was it was a big deal for him mm -hmm. because he prides himself uh, in his memoirs. Uh, stating that um, while he was the surgeon of the sixth here in the winter, none of his patients died. And that was his big claim to fame. Yeah, 200 mm -hmm. plus patients and not one single patient died. That's pretty good and claim to were, fame back in those days. That's a pretty big claim to fame is right, you know. And the, one uh, of the experiments that he did with Alexis uh, St. Martin were done partly in Plattsburgh, uh, partly in Quebec, uh, partly in Burlington, Vermont. Mm -hmm. And partly in Washington D.C. So uh, oh, there's I wasn't quite, aware of Washington. Yes, there. and uh, Alexis uh, St. Martin went to Washington and, and uh, allowed himself to be examined a few more Hope times. And yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> isn't that a, talk about it was, talk about a guinea pig? Well, and and uh, when after uh, uh, yeah. uh, William Beaumont w in the later years of his army life was assigned to St. Louis and mm -hmm. ultimately uh, retired from the army in St. Louis and went into p uh, private practice. And um, at one of the uh, hospitals in St. Louis, there's a, uh, a wonderful correspondence between William Beaumont and Alexis St. Martin. And Alexis St. Martin was essentially <clears throat> illiterate, at least in English. You may have been able to read French. I don't know. He was French-Canadian, of course. Um, 
but he would end up getting his parish priest or others to write the letters back to to Beaumont, and and there would be there that. would be there would be notes on the bottom from the actual author of the letter indicating that this is not direct. This has been translated from from uh, oh. Alexis Saint Martin's uh, verbal uh, communication. So and 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 you can see that. Um, Right up until uh, very close to the end of his life, uh, William Beaumont, Dr. Beaumont, was attempting to get Alexis St. Martin to, reach, to actually go out to St. Louis. Oh, yes, and, he and, was. And, he was and, kind and of desperate to do that in the he end. So the, the man was a, a researcher. I mean, you know, as a, as a faculty member, we, we, we think in terms of our progress in our careers coming through our research. And uh, William Beaumont was, was uh, not only a... Uh, a, a, a leader uh, in, in his gastric work, he, he was really a leader in research in medicine. And it's for that reason that the medical community has always recognized him. And most of the important uh, symposia, more important than the one, the one we organized here in Plattsburg, I would say, uh, have been organized by the medical community around, around gastric studies. You like his early things from his, an historical standpoint. Um, it, it turns out that in his younger life, he was quite a cad. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. When he was single uh, and he was on the make here, he, um, I believe it was Marjorie Lansing uh, that pointed out that, uh, that he had some real problems with a young lady. On, uh, <laughs> yes, that comes out. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, on, In fact, there was a suit, I think. I don't I think there was all by the way it's duel. Yeah, that's <laughs> duel. Right. That's and right. it was George Richards and George Richards was McCombs, General McCombs aide de camp and his first artillery officer. And he is the one that exposed Mr. Beaumont Isn't as being uh, something less than a gentleman when it regards the ladies and they there was an open discussion in the paper uh, of no those kidding. oh yes oh, yeah. those who those who supported Mr. Beaumont and those who supported Captain Richards. And then there was a challenge to a duel. And it took General oh, McCoon to step in and say, you know, first of all, facing, they don't have no duels around facing there. what he had. He had a very talented surgeon who was very necessary for the troops. And he had a very talented young officer of the artillery who was his aide de camp. And imagine what would happen if they shot each other and they both died. <laughs> well, we, we may be lucky that Dr. Beaumont didn't end up on the other end of the experiment. That's true. That's true. <laughs> didn't, didn't, he, didn't he also hire an intermediary to go yes. in his place Amazing. to uh, to carry out the duel? Oh, really? Just amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and General yeah. McComb put the stoppers That's to That's something it. you'd really want to volunteer for, <laughs> isn't it? I guess so. Let me, let well, me later, just... Well, of course, he came back to Plattsburgh uh, and married yes. uh, Deborah Platt, Deborah Platt, who was the oh, uh, divorced uh, former wife of, and I'm not sure who it was now, uh, Maybe it's in here. Maybe it's in there, but uh, uh, in any case, that marriage lasted for quite a while, and she accompanied him to St. Louis, and she, in fact, is buried in a cemetery in St. Louis right next to him. Good. I'll, I'll check my information, too. She I want to let... to be quite... Uh, yeah, she li outlived yeah. him by quite a bit. By yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. I want to... We, we, we said that uh, he, he got his medical license, if you will, in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Third Medical Society of Vermont approved William to practice what was then called physic and surgery. Physic and surgery. Mm -hmm. Is that great? And when Keith talks about treating the troops, let me tell you, the soldiers came down with dysentery, pleurisy, pneumonia, sore throats, rheumatism, and typhus was treated with wine, opium, you like this, John? Snake root and mercury. 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 <laughs> Wonderful. Don't you love it? Yeah. Rheumatism pain, Doesn't Beaumont say. prescribed opium, wood resin, and turpentine. Oh, my God. Whoa. He was proud of that fact. But no, no one died. And no one died. Of his 200 or so troops, Isn't that none died. Truly? And his, count, his counter physician lost a number of patients. Lost a number. And man yes. himself oh lost yeah. several. Yep. Now, the size, the size of this wound changed over the years, as I understand it. At first, he could only get, it says he could only get his entire forefinger into the stomach cavity. Oh, boy. And his tongue. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to John, I'm so happy again. you came here today. As I said, reality takes on a whole new meaning, right? Uh, oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that one away for a while. <laughs>
It said the aperture was about two and a half inches in circumference. Circumference. Yep. And no. the food and drink, it said, would constantly extrude unless it was covered with something, right? Mm -hmm. And to have to... <laughs> I don't know if it would be condescending, I would guess so, to have somebody stick their hands in your stomach. Not if you're being paid. Yeah, I don't know how much they paid him. Well, that, that, that isn't listed, but he did, and one of them, he uh, insisted that his family be paid also and be uh, and mm -hmm. brought here. Yes. So, and oh, that that's was right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. I had forgotten that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, he yeah. did. He insisted that his family be... be uh, their passage yep. be paid sure. to come to here. Yeah, that's to right. Be paid too. while they were here too. Yes. And, but and these experiments were done over a period of months, and yeah, you would yeah. expect, I think, that the whole family would want to relocate. This was not a one-day deal. Oh, right. Yes. No, yeah. No. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And obviously, in retrospect, it was a very important piece of work that oh, they my did. Goodness, mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. he he would yep. not only put the food in there on a silk string and drag it out and put it in a test tube and so on, but he'd make. St. Martin fast for 17 yes, hours. Yep. <laughs> and, and was, he did a number of experiments to see what would stimulate the formation of the mm -hmm, acid. Mm -hmm. Isn't fasted, that amazing when you think he, about it now? Look at the temperature because the initial one, the putrefaction, was felt that the stomach heated up when food was in it, and that's what accelerated the mm -hmm. putre, but he proved that that wasn't proved it so. Proved was incorrect. So he took temperatures, he stimulated, he put food in, and you could see what stimulated acid formation. So That's we did wonderful. a number of experiments in it. It's, mm -hmm. it's truly incredible. I couldn't find the name we were looking for. That's all right. Never mind. It's in there somewhere. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. Maybe this was one the of doctor, you mean? In... No, you wanted the, the name of, uh, of the, the person. Platt family, the uh, Platt family. Which one it was. It was Deborah, but which family she was from, yeah, I, I didn't don't remember. Book. Yeah. I had a book in our library. We have a book in our library, which is hard to find. But the, the, she, the was amazing the she was the daughter of Israel Green. The, yes, the yes. there you Israel go. Green, okay. she, married, I got it. she married a Platt, yeah. and then he yeah. married her after. It's there in, it is. It's in Israel the introduction Green. that I wrote to the proceedings. Yeah. And, Absolutely. The, and the fact that St. Martin actually lived 58 years after he was shot in the gut with a musket yep. ball. We did it himself. And Yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> It, it was doesn't an matter accident, how it happened, but he lived to be 86. Wow. Four, 84. Oh, okay. This one said 86. What Maybe you guys well, can there, straight... that, that actually was straightened out in the Canadian dedication. For some reason, there was a mistake in the, oh, in, it was. In, in the okay. age. Um, they had June 24th, 1880. Was that right? <coughs> I think St. that's St. Thomas correct. and Joliet, Canada. Mm -hmm. St. Thomas, yeah. Yeah, mm. St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. to, to let the body <laughs> putrefy for four days. <laughs> I, well, several interesting things here too, Calvin. But you have to also remember that this was not a wealthy family. I mean, this was a oh, yeah. family, a very, very much a working class family, and uh, I, I think they probably had sensitivities about dissection and and, sure. and, and those yeah. kinds of things. I mean, that's not uncommon. For, that's for that's a good point. I hadn't thought for of less that. Less well-educated people to you know to. It doesn't surprise me that they would go through great lengths to to protect the body. Were, uh, did you say you learned of this when you were just a young, a young kid in school? I did. Yeah. No, you I did. did. I, I, I was I, saying I, they didn't teach it to us oh, in okay. Champlain. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. We have a plaque there, but I never remember it. Maybe I didn't take it. Did you know? There, well, there was a series. There's a series of books. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know if they're still in the, in the school libraries today, but there was a series of books of biographies written for youth, and. Uh, one of them was on say, on Coleman, uh, uh, and I, I can remember reading that as a as a young a young oh, middle school age uh, school child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I knew also, but just because I'm very curious and lo always loved history, reading about Beaumont before I moved here in 1961. Mm -hmm. But so I've learned so much more over the years and try to make a connection with all of that. Yeah. So very interesting. This is something that Calvin uh, found. I'll show you a take picture it out of, of there it. so it won't glare. Can you can you see that, Calvin? Uh, it's a little glare. Okay. Okay, a little glare. Flip that out of there. And oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. That's a classic painting. It shows up in uh, quite a bit of the quite a number of the Whoops. articles. <laughs> Wrong one. Many of the articles about. Well, that was nice backing yeah. anyway. You bet. And, and I'm reasonably certain it's a fictional. Did you have this? <laughs> uh, did you buy this a long time ago, Cal? A couple of years ago. A couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. Is it who had it published in the magazine, right? Wyeth. Yeah. Wyeth on the bottom? Yeah. yeah. This was long right. before they were in Rouse's Point, of course. Mm -hmm. 
They're in the news a lot these days because of uh, what's happening up there now. That was part now. of a series that they did on, on uh, great moments Pioneers in Pioneers of history. American yeah, medicine. That's right. Yeah, the advertisement by John Wyeth and Brothers of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Got a picture there, John? Yeah, mm -hmm. this is a, a portrait that was uh, painted by uh, what, the Washington University in St. Louis. <coughs> Doesn't say, yeah, by a Chester Harding. What is that? A little book, a little booklet, John? Yeah, yes. Calvin. <clears throat> Calvin buys <clears throat> stuff over the internet. Yeah, yeah let me many see. Many of them are, are from Champlain. <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> they pass the wealth around, right? <laughs> Do we know who that person was? <laughs> oh, you gotta love it. Ed Ray. Yeah. Ed Ray, it says up here in the yeah, corner. That wasn't from Champlain. That's oh, this one wasn't from somewhere that else. Wasn't, that wasn't Ken's father. <coughs> no, that no. was. This this is a what appears to be a booklet published by the Mackinac Island State Park Commission. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, by Keith R. Witter. Yeah. Very interesting. 1975. Yeah. There you go. It's probably about that? I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if that wasn't still Big in print. Big picture right in the front there. There, there he is. is. There How is. about this? There's a There's good a one. There's a young right dasher. There. That's yeah. what got him in trouble. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, oh boy. And then he wound well. up moving into the neighborhood. When he came back to Plattsburgh, he moved to the, uh, the area right around where St. John's Church was. Oh, oh really? Gosh. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. It was, and it was on the north side, I believe, of uh, a Broad Street. So right about where the uh, uh, Friends of the Homeless, or the, was that where it was? Yeah, the Friends of the Homeless was right yeah, there on the corner. Right, right there on the corner. Right there, and, and it was somewhere in that first block that uh, Beaumont moved in when he came back to Plattsburgh here. Here are a couple of interesting pictures. There's a well, picture of Deborah Platt Beaumont oh yeah, okay. right here. That's great. And it's called Dr. William Beaumont, The Mackinac Years. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, I didn't know this. Copy well, that appears to be a painting. Yeah, yep, sure it does. Is. Uh, I wonder if there aren't photographs of her. She lived long is enough. There one, there's another one in the back further of her uh, at older age, I think, somewhere. Really? This, wow. this is just great Maybe stuff. There's a, there's, a a, there's a photograph. There's a photograph. Uh, we got a Alexis. picture of Alexis right here. Mm-hmm. You weren't feminist, John. No, Jim, were you? No, not at all. <laughs> no, that's great. That's fabulous. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I'll have to find that book. That's for sure. There, there's the family right here. 18 there. Dr. William Beaumont. That's a painting also, but mm -hmm. Dr. William Beaumont and family from a 18. painting at the University of Chicago. Lucretia, Deborah, Sarah, William, and Israel known as Buddy. Israel. Oh, this is presumably a, named after his grandfather. Yeah, his grandfather. Yeah. There you go. Wait a minute. Oh, what what Doc what got you, there? Look that, at this. This is uh, Alexis with his hole showing. Well, well, now, better phrase that better. <laughs> it's fistula. I want everybody in the show North you Country said to know what I'm bleeped? talking about. <laughs> they don't know what fistula. Oh no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The area I, of observation. How's that? Oh, this is. Look at this stuff. Wow. This is Centennial. Oh my gosh. This these is, are all courtesy. Oh, of Cal, these are all courtesy of Calvin. Calvin's got a. Wow. He's got a neat library. Every once in a while, we get into his library and do a television show up there because he comes. You know, if you noodle around on eBay. Oh yeah. You can yeah. get copies oh, of some very, great. very that's, interesting. Uh, that's just great. Interesting things. Advertisement in the Plattsburgh Republican. You Look betcha. At, that's just a painting. I think. Oh, yeah. These are Yeah, these that's are the great. same painting yeah. as this one. Yeah, that's, you see this oh, one quite there's, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's there the it is. Card yeah, there. I've seen this picture before. I don't know where I've seen it. A drawing, I mean. Yeah, these are in the book. The, these, uh -huh. this, this, okay. these are in the book. These are all in his book. Yeah. In his book, okay, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. yeah like this one I've seen book. before. Yeah, yeah that's that. a famous one. Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful stuff. Yeah. Beautiful. And what else have we got? We got this book. What's this book? This one? They got the uh, kids' book that was in there, John. Oh, there's a kids' book, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, I wonder if that's the one I read when I was a kid. Calvin's goodie bag. There you go. It's, uh, another one on Dr. Beaumont. He was very, I guess we probably huh. mentioned this, he was very okay, meticulous he's got it. Let's and see. very well read and also exacting. 
and he kept notes about just about everything, daily notes on the progress or problems with uh, Alexis. So well, 1978, really this would be later than the one I now, read. Aren't, aren't Beaumont's papers in uh, Yale or Harvard? Weren't they transferred? Do you know that, Jim? I don't. I don't. I'm sorry, I don't. I thought they were in St. Louis. You don't I don't know. I don't know. I, I know some of, them are in, mixed up with some, some, some of them are in St. Louis. It does. It does. I should have uh, uh, brought yeah. the book that I got from our library uh, because it did mention some of his papers are in uh, St. Louis because he helped to form uh, St. Louis uh, Medical School, Washington University Medical, Medical School. School. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting in local history and how it ties together. The, the Medical Society here in Plattsburgh was started by H.K. Averill. Yes, right. There you go. So it, it all ties together who was, who was a contemporary, his father was, of, of Beaumont. Wonderful stuff. And this book didn't come from anywhere around here, but you, you got it on the Internet, right? Yeah. And it's uh, published in New York. Well, it's it's I can't it's read from under a school. here. I don't know. An elementary well, that, school. That's an elementary yes. school that was yeah. put in. But the other thing of interest about uh, Binghamton, Dr. Binghamton. Beaumont, is that the, he was very no. curious about what happened to his patients too. Burnwood, and he did like autopsies, that. which was kind of frowned upon back then. Mm -hmm. He had a special interest in head injuries because there were a number of fights and people falling oh, down. Lots of, and yeah, sure. He tells a story, or it's told a story about this head injury patient. Uh, I think it was probably a, uh, an infantryman that came in, and he tested the vital signs, and he said, well, it sounds like there's some bleeding uh, inside. So he drilled a hole, which is called tree fining. The blood came out, and the patient did well for a couple of days, but went downhill and died several days later. So he said, something else going on. And he opened up the skull, and he found a fragment of bone from the skull that it penetrated the brain and mm. called it, caused an abscess, which eventually caused it. So he was a very curious person and documented just about everything he did, I understand. Mm -hmm. and That's well, wonderful. There's a good story uh, from his first medical practice here in Plattsburgh. Uh, he was seeking a skeleton. And from what I understand, one of the people that was hung uh, was allowed to decompose and they took all the flesh off and that particular piece went into his office so it it was in his office and I believe that came from Marjorie Lansing too. No kidding. Yeah so it's got to be in the paper somewhere I'll have to look it up. Mm -hmm. Makes you want to run well, maybe, right up. It to may us. be in her book. Uh, it's possible. That could be yeah. too. Yeah. But most of her books were based on the, the newspaper. Art. Right that's, no that's right I mean Absolutely. it might have been reprinted in the book. Yeah. yeah. We're interested, I'm sure Calvin is interested, for anybody watching this program who might have a little bit of memorabilia, Beaumont memorabilia, because, you know, there are so many things hidden away in people's dresser drawers oh and those boxes well, look of books what Calvin's that we found about. on the Internet. Yeah. And over what mm -hmm. period of time, Calvin? Well, there is, there is a display in St. Albans of some of his tools. They were oh, transferred? Uh, yes. yes. No mm -hmm. kidding? Yes. I did not know uh, that. And, and I, I can't remember. I think it's in one of the historical society buildings, not, not a hospital. It behooves us to learn about people like this because just because he was a part of our, our heritage here, but because he influenced these guys were so brilliant that they influenced everything that happened after that. Think about it. Now, you mentioned the process of tree, tree, finding. tree finding, and here we are, we, we, we go back in ancient history. And, and still used. And, and still used, and yes. people in almost but prehistoric we times were now trying to... we can to, identify where the bleed is so we don't have to go poking around to look for. But, you know, isn't it amazing when we dig up these almost prehistoric skeletons and find that somebody mm -hmm. was trying to drill a hole in their head to see what was going on in there? Yeah. Actually, amazing. the kinds of surgical things that happened long before we were born in ancient history, right? Mm -hmm. John? Yeah. Now you, you practice, how many years did you practice? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be 50 years this year if I were still practicing. And your wife said it was too oh my God. No, she said, no, she was very supportive. I was very fortunate. She was very supportive, but when it came time to say, okay, she was supportive of that decision, too. There you go. But John, even though he looks like a dashing young man. Oh, Keith. Why do they call it practicing, though? 
After a while, practice should make perfect, shouldn't it? Or it doesn't. Huh? Yeah, nothing, nothing like cliches. <laughs> Even though John is, looks like a dashing young man, he represents an era in his profession that uh, of necessity is pretty much gone. And just to bring this in, I have no idea what Dr. Beaumont charged each one I of do. his patients. It's 25 cents for an office visit. Known. He'd know. And uh, 20 cents a mile if he made a house call. 38 cents for a night call. <laughs> Don't you love it, Jim? Oh well, compare it. You know? yes, Compare it to you. Well, you well, were up to two dollars when you no, started. I started at four. Oh, you started at four dollars. I love it. <laughs> Did you really start at four dollars? Mm -hmm. Yes, and then house calls were six, no matter where I went. I remember going way up north of Blackman's Corners and raising my house call fee from six to seven, and the woman was fit to be tied. Can you believe that? <laughs> and her husband had was very well to do. I can tell you that. Better sure. than physicians. Yes, and what a difference. And now, in certain communities, in metropolitan areas, uh, doctors are reverting to, to house calls, mm -hmm. as I read in some of the well, magazines. Well, you know, you can learn about people. Go visit them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. You don't have to be nosy. Like the Just old minister right. and the That's old right. clergyman, the old priest. My dad was an old country preacher. And he, if he... I thought you were going to say he was a priest. But no, <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That would have been made for an interesting discussion oh, yeah. here. But he would make a point to visit every single family at mm -hmm. least once a year. And they, in those days, they had circuits. They had he had three, four, five churches. And that you know, before his time, they rode around on horseback. Fortunately, he had old cars to do that. But he learned about these families, as you said. And Calvin and I went back to cover a parade in Moira, where I went to high school. And a lady walked up to me with a photograph of my father, kneeling at her bedside when she was a little girl. She was d gonna die. And my father did a, like a three-day vigil, never went to bed, never ate a thing, and stayed there and prayed ferv fervently. And she credits that with saving her life. And she carries that picture with her. She didn't know I was even going to be there that day. But that picture of my father was in her wallet. You think I didn't shed a little tear when she sure. showed me that. But that's what it was like. And, of course, my father, on the, on the more jocular side, loved food as much as I do, so he always made those house visits right around. <laughs> Dinner time. <laughs> well, the, 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 the day of, of the doctor who made house calls uh, brings back D.S. Kellogg, David Kellogg. Oh, yes. He was yes. probably the epitome, in my, in my mind anyway, of, of the general practitioner who made house calls. And this and, is a doctor for all hours. And who was a fantastic what historian. A historian, yes, absolutely. But there's two recent ones, too, Bill Ledoux. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, yes. oh yes. my yes. goodness! Yes, right. yes Bill George Ledoux. Clark, and the George Clark and Shay-Z, who's still alive. I go visit him once in a while. That's wonderful. And uh, but you know, just that was it, and it got to be a routine. It was like the minister making yeah home visits. Oh, yeah, well, it really you was. You mentioned now Dr. Kellogg, track. and yeah. uh, this proceedings includes a uh, the one we showed earlier. Yeah, in, includes an article or. A, biographical article about Dr. Kellogg by our renowned Alan Everest. Alan Everest, mm -hmm. that's that was actually the last, pre well, the second to last presentation at our conference. And yeah. he's the one who wrote the book, A Doctor at All Hours. Look yes. it up, people. It's that's wonderful right. it reading. Is. That's it right. Is. It is wonderful reading. Yeah. Yes. Thank good. You know, I'm Thank glad we mentioned Dr. Everest. Alan Everest because uh, Keith spent how many years of his life trying to to prove some of these things that oh, Dr. Alan Everest so could only speculate about based on the research that mm -hmm. he did. And isn't it nice when you can confirm those things? Absolutely. Here we are in and 2009 saying, here's what he said, here's what I found. And he was absolutely right all the way. All the way Just down. Just couldn't, couldn't get enough information to prove it. But, uh, you know, when, when it turns out uh, that the hypothesis suddenly turns into fact, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, and unfortunately, he wasn't around to see it happen. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. too bad. But, but he was and a, the uh, most recent newsletter of the uh, Battle of Plattsburgh Association, where we're meeting here today, features that story. Absolutely. And and it's a good one. It's right on the front page. Right on the front page, exactly. Yeah. Is it really? Come and get your copy. <laughs> <laughs> and join the association. Well, my <laughs> wife saw her in, in our little mall in Champlain, saw him. 
and had a book that he had written. Oh, yes. So, I don't know why she had to have it in the car. I took it over to him. She's to very sign it? shy. And she said, Would you sign? Oh, I'd love to. And they spent about an hour conversing. That's and probably the longest was... conversation they ever had in a grocery yeah. store with anybody. Yeah. It wasn't easy to get to see him, was oh, it? Oh, no. It was Keith? terrible. It was, he was, it's probably off the Beaumont subject. But what a, yeah, what a nice I exchange so. I had with, with Mrs. Everest because she was, she was his keeper. Mm -hmm. And she was the handler for the situation. And it's a great story. I, I called on the phone, and I, I had this interest in Pike's Contonement and a couple other issues that were happening. And, and I wanted to meet with the doctor uh, for a very short period of time. And, and I, the phone rang at the house, and this wonderful lady came on the other end and said, uh, yes, may I help you? And I explained who I was, and, she, and I explained what I was looking for. And she said, well, you know, the doctor's very busy. And I said, yes, ma'am, I appreciate that. But if you'd pass that on, uh, you know, possibly we could, uh, I'll call in, in a little while and, you know, and, uh, and we'll see if we can't do something. And I called back about a week later and I told her who I was and she remembered. And she said, well, you know, the doctor's very busy. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I, you know, here's, here's what I propose. 15 minutes, I will send a list of my questions ahead if that's possible. And the doctor can uh, take his time and when he's ready, he can get in touch with me, and, and uh, I'd love to sit down. And it, even if he would feel comfortable just answering them and mailing them to me, that's fine. Well, I didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks, and finally I, I got my, uh, my dander up a little bit. And, uh, and the fact that I'm, I felt it like I was neglected for some reason, and I called back, and she said, yes, I remember who, who you are. And she said, you know, the doctor's very busy. And it was bizarre. <laughs> and then I said, yes, ma'am, I appreciate that. Is there anything else I can do, anything that I didn't forward to him? And, and she said, no, no, um, I will pass it on. And weeks went by. And then I got a phone call. And it was Doc Everest. And he said, I understand you, uh, you want to speak with me. And I said, yes, sir, I, I do. I promise I won't take up much of your time. 15 minutes is all I need. You already have a list of the questions and, you know, the area that I'm interested in. I'd just like to speak with you. I made an appointment, went to his house, showed up a couple of minutes early, walked in, and, and Mrs. Everest shuffled me to his front office. I don't know if you've been, been into his house there on, on Catherine Street or what was his house. And he had an office, and there were three tables or three desks, and there were piles of papers on each desk. Of course. And I walked in, and he said, well, first of all, he smoked like a chimney, if yeah. you remember. And I walked in, and he said, do you mind if I smoke? And I said, Dr. Everest, it's your home. Do you mind if I sit down? And he said, no. And, um, and, and we started to talk, and 15 minutes ran into 45 before everything was over. But then I, I got, enough, uh, got enough background into me where I felt comfortable in, in the questions that I had. And I said, Dr why do you have three desks? And he said, well, here's the way I work. I work at that one, and then it, it's a separate project. And when I get bored, I put it down, and I move to the other desk. And then when I get bored with that one, I move to this desk. Isn't that and it was just amazing. a wonderful deal. Anyway, that's my Dr. Everest story. He, what, what a nice fellow. What wonderful he memories. Was. And you, we've mentioned a few local and area historians uh, that we all have revered knowing over the years. Mm. These great, great people, Calvin and I have done shows about his books on, on houses. He loved the old Wonderful. architecture and loved the old houses. And it just pleases us to show the pictures and try to figure out what happened to that house since he wrote the book way back in the 1970s. You know what I've been looking for? Rum across the border. Another copy. Oh, yeah. They're hard to find. Cal they're you've they're got it, Calvin. Calvin's got well, I've got one. I've got, got one. one. But <laughs> you see them once in a while. Um, Border Patrol agent named Han McRae, and he would ride on his car, you know, like uh, like Wild West on oh, the yeah. running board back then. <laughs> oh, anyway, God. this is a daughter-in-law of Han McRae, and his name is mentioned in ran in Rum across Rum Rum across, across the, border. the border. And I've looked around, and I can't find. Well, oh, Calvin's well, looked and found mind, one. Keep, you found keep that one in mind. Did you do see that? Joke. Occasionally, well, them, yeah. you know, we, we bring these things up and Calvin's phone rings off the hook or I'll get an email and somebody saying, well, you never looked in my dresser drawer. I got a copy there of that. You go. One, one of the things that fostered my early interest in local history, uh, which actually goes back a long, long way, but I happened to come to the college in 1970 and uh, just 
learned that I was going to get tenure in 1976. And in 1976, as you know, that was the bicentennial year. Oh, yes. And Alan Everest offered a special summer course mm -hmm. on local history. Alan knew everybody. And, Absolutely. Uh, so I asked him if, uh, and I knew him, and I asked him because I'd been involved with the Historical Association yeah. even that early. And uh, I asked him if I could uh, audit the course. And uh, he wasn't sure if he wanted me to do that. I said, <laughs> but, but I said, really, all I would want to do is to sit. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, burden you with grading papers or anything like that. And he said, well, I think it'll be all right. So he allowed me to do that. And I went to every class over a period of six weeks, five days a week, as summer session always runs. And virtually every class involved a presenter. And he brought historians in from oh, yes. all over sure New York mm -hmm. and all over Vermont. And each one gave a presentation on a, on a single topic that relates to the, the North Country. And it was a wonderful opportunity to be exposed to the, the, the panorama of North Country history, particularly, of course, the Revolutionary War and the French and Indian War and, of course, the War of 1812. And um, I still have a folder with all of the notes and handouts, et cetera, et cetera, from in that course. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a box, yes, in a box. You uh, mean you keep stuff <laughs> too, Jim? I, I, I'm a my, pack, my, I, I admit to being a pack say, rat. <laughs> oh, goodness. Anybody my, who's been in my office my knows house. that. Um, no, aren't we yeah. all? Uh, we, uh, you know, never says three desks. Well, I've got five, so there you go. Oh, you <laughs> do? <laughs> okay. It is amazing. What is you know, it? What? Do you want to get back to... Uh, to Beaumont? Well, oh, well, specifics. Yeah. No, no, this is interesting. Oh, well. Really, Jim. I had no, both you guys. I, I'm learning more today. Oh, In fact, it. I used to tell people, whoever will listen, that I used to get more from my patients than they got from me. So I'm getting a lot of history from no, you guys, it, and I it, appreciate it. But you got notes, and I know you yeah, always you have go. notes. So well, tell these me. are the specifics about what he found in digestion. Okay, okay. I wanna, okay. we okay. need to know that. So mm -hmm. he, uh, he put corned beef. Raw salted pork, boiled salted beef, fat pork, stale bread. I don't know why he used stale bread, but he did. And shredded cabbage. Not shredded wheat, shredded cabbage. But they, no, they didn't have it. One hour, the cabbage and bread were half digested. The meat was unchanged. That's in one hour. The starch. Yep. In two hours, the cabbage, the pork, and the boiled beef were digested. The rest, including the... Uh, the salted, raw salted pork were not. And mm -hmm. at the end of three hours, uh, everything was at least partly digested, except for the raw meat, which was only surface. There was only surface digestion The raw meat. On it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Describe and then, again how he did that. Oh, he, oh, yeah. he put a, a silk yeah, string. Yeah, he had silk string, and he just held Drop it Drop it in. Mm -hmm. And Not I don't enough. know if he got to, if he stayed there for an hour, it doesn't say, or whether he had Alexis paid him a little extra to hold it himself. But anyway, after the third hour, Alexis said, that's enough. I got a headache and pain, and I don't want to quit. <laughs> so, well, that's, you know, this is I, <laughs> we, and we should point out that... that more often than not, this whole thing was very distressing to this young man through the hole in his stomach. I mean, you're putting food in oh, and yes. taking it out, mm -hmm. and taking gastric juice and putting it in a, uh, in, mm -hmm. a in a test tube, and you know, the the doctor's running an experiment, and this guy's trying to <laughs> trying to get that meal digested in his stomach, and he wasn't even allowed to keep it in there half That's the time. That's a seat, right? It was either that or, as I said and he before, tried he over a... the years, as you mentioned, he tried over the years to find a way to seal that fistula, and mm -hmm. just nothing would seal it. He yeah. was able to form some sort of a valve, mechanical valve, so that the food didn't uh, all come out oh, through yeah. the fistula. That right. the man, well, obviously the man mm -hmm. became very healthy and fathered seventeen kids. It must have not have bothered his wife to have that fistula. Apparently not. Isn't that a, that's... <laughs> That's a, truly, is there anything else about well, the man that we haven't mentioned, Jim? Can you think of no, anything? No, the only comment I was going to make is that the, the concept of, of creating a fistula in animals for study is, is actually a modern concept. And when I was the director up at Minor Center, uh, the Minor Institute had uh, at least one animal, as I recall. I oh, believe mine? it was a sheep. A sheep. A sheep, yeah. Uh, where they had surgically created a fistula. Obviously, it wouldn't have been as traumatic of a wound as the as the one that uh, Dr. Beaumont was dealing with. But they were doing digestive exper experiments, um, uh, 
uh, as part of their agricultural research program, mm -hmm. and that's uh, apparently not so unusual uh, with animals. I, I wouldn't imagine you do it to a person, but uh, obviously, but um, uh, so it, it's, it's a study that that still has merit. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, what a fascinating the, guy. The couple of other things about him, too. Uh, he was very concerned about, well, I suppose this is uh, uh, not saying very much, but very concerned about his patients and their welfare. When he got out to Mackinac, he had a, they had a garden out there, but it was only part of a garden. And he liked to think, in fact, was right, that fresh vegetables and fruits were important. Well, it turned out that the next-door neighbor was the manager of Indian Affairs, and he petitioned the government to allow him to have part of that garden to expand his building. Well, uh, I guess it's fair to say that Beaumont was not shy, and he peti petitioned himself and was forceful enough to say, hey, you keep your Indian business on the other side, we're going to keep our garden, and he got through with Isn't it. Isn't that it's a little known fact? I'd never heard that part of the story no, either, before. Yeah. And the other thing is, you probably know how he died, and I told you he was very yes. interested in head injury, yep. slipped on the ice, hit slipped his head. Oh, well, you know, I yep. forgot to say that. Yes, he right. was, he suffered was very, accident. very yeah. serious yeah. Right. hematoma yeah. or some yeah. other yeah. injury. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was leaving a patient's mm. home. Right, and fell he off the steps yep. and landed backwards, I think, on his head. And he knew he was in trouble, too, Yeah. because apparently he prepared his wife for it, right. uh, that we're not going to come out of this or something to that effect. I don't remember exactly where I read that, but... Mm -hmm. Since we're getting yeah, off I'm base so glad bit, you mentioned I'll that. tell you an anecdotal <laughs> oh, story about... Here we go. Your wife's going to love this, John. <laughs> about Dr. Taylor in Moore's. Dr. Taylor made as many house calls, probably, as Bill Ledoux and George Clark put together. But I had an elderly patient, well, elderly then, my goodness, I'm old now. Anyway, <laughs> she tells the story that this Dr. Taylor made a house call in the middle of the winter, winter and trudged up to their porch, got in the house, and on the way out had a heart attack and died. Uh. And she said, that's the way I like to see some people work. He worked right until oh. he died. And she was serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we hope my doctor kills over on my back that's porch, right? right? Ouch. <laughs> uh, so, Jim, what are you doing these days? Well, I'm still on the Board of Regents. I'm still uh, on the faculty at the university, primarily teaching courses in geology and still maintaining my interest in local history to the extent that I can. I'm uh, just about to sign up for um, one of the uh, weekend uh, 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 symposia that they have at Fort Ticonderoga. And, uh, Wonderful. So we'll Isn't be, it great? Uh, yeah. Calvin and I did a series, did all the forts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for their reenactments and their various celebrations. That we'd wanted to do it for a long time and finally did it. Mm -hmm. Isn't it wonderful? Yep. It the reenactments like, are getting better, like and better, better and better and better and better. It's still viable. And it's yes, well, well, the Fort right. Tye seems to have come out of their financial right. crisis and they seem to be doing all right. One of the things I do with the Board of Regents is to chair their Cultural Education Committee. I've been doing that for a while. And that's the committee on the board that has oversight over the State Museum, but also all of the uh, chartered museums in the state, including our, our own institution yeah. here, BOPA, uh, and um, State Library and the 7,000 libraries in the state and State Archives, and public television, too. And that keeps me busy. We're in the throes right now of uh, developing a new set of, uh, actually, a new state law, if it, if, if it goes the way we think it might go, that would deal with how um, museums can deaccession uh, materials mm -hmm. and, and putting some rather strict limits, really, on that process, exactly. which is... Has uh, has come up uh, in recent in, in recent years. So um, yeah, those kinds of things keep me very busy. That's great, John. Okay. John and I go to an occasional auto show, and we missed this year. Think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I was in Hawaii. Two more things about <laughs> Beaumont, if you want. He was stone deaf, and this was on a prank. If he was uh, bet somebody that he could stand closer to a cannon than they would. Oh goodness! Oh my! And he lost his hearing because That's of that. That's terrible. But he used a trumpet. And, of course, back then... The hearing trumpet. Yeah. yeah. So people don't know. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, back then, the stethoscope had not been invented yet. Lenek hadn't invented the stethoscope. So that didn't impair him as far as listening to heart sounds and as far as uh, listening to lung sounds. But he was. He was deaf. Uh, but uh, he managed to overcome that with his hands and his vision and 
Being you said to, two things. He was deaf, and what was the other thing? The other thing was that he was thought very highly of local physicians, called him in consultation very often when they had problems with their own patients. Oh. Uh, and he wasn't shy again, as I said, about offering his opinion. Yeah. Doctors, doctors. Doctors, doctors. Doctor. Doctor. He was a doctor. 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 Yeah. Just mm -hmm. to let people know that uh, you have our enduring thanks for letting us use your space here at the 1812 no Museum. Mm -hmm. We're so thrilled to be here because if this was our dream for how many years? Oh, yes. Many, Keith, many, many. Keith and I have commiserated <laughs> on at least 10 million topics over the years. <laughs> we like what you're doing here. Keith. Yeah, it's wonderful. Really? And as Jim was yeah. saying, uh, we're in the process now. We have a provisional charter right at the moment, and we're in the process of completing the paperwork mm -hmm. uh, to get a formal charter. Yep. And that's, that's where we're at. Working with David Palmquist, I'm sure. Yes, <laughs> uh, David, good friend. I uh, met him years ago mm -hmm. on the State Archives Advisory Board, and uh, I still serve on that board, but uh, he's no longer on the board, as you know. Yep. He's uh, moved on to bigger and better things. I got to tell you, it's, Jeff, it's, it's fitting that we're sitting here in front of some of the plaques associated with oh, Crab absolutely. Island. Absolutely, isn't it amazing? Because that, of course, was the the hospital the site hospital after the battle, for and I am sure that yeah. Beaumont spent many hours out there think dealing about with these patients. Did. Yes. Think about it, gentlemen. This has been a huge kick to me, and we're Not gonna yet. we're gonna <laughs> pause for just a moment before we get to wrap it up. So you want to start? A little <laughs> so you want to start. A little housekeeping near the end here. First of all, Jim wanted to mention something else. There was a name that you came up with in your introduction way well, back when that you wanted to make sure we got in here. Well, I just wanted to make sure that we understood that one of the doctors that uh, he worked with was Seth Pomeroy in uh, uh, Champlain. And uh, that work, I gather, led to his interest in medicine to some extent. Well, there you go. We want we don't want to leave any stone unturned. Now, John, what have you got? What's that book? This is a Fighter Against Slavery, Yehudi Ashman by Arthur Ormond. When Yehudi Ashman was a college student just after the War of 1812, he found himself searching for a cause that would give his life purpose. He joined an anti-slavery society and was assigned to take a shipload of Negro immigrants to the new colony in the jungles of Africa. Here he found a cause which fired his imagination to establish colonies in Africa for oppressed American Negroes and at the same time eliminate slavery in the United States. Remember this, 1812. As a boy in Champlain, Yehudi was often accused of living in a dream world, but he was both a realist and a missionary to whom the unjust treatment of any man was intolerable. When he arrived in Africa, he found the pledging colony all but disseminated by disease and starvation and threatened by hostile natives. For ten years, he waged a heroic and extraordinary battle against the slave trade and led his men in raids against local slave factories. He invited slaves he freed to join his colonies, which prospered under his wise leadership. The diplomat and administrative power is Yehudi exhibited, the local chiefs named him the White Lion. All the while, Yehudi was plagued by personal difficulties that would have destroyed a lesser man, attacks by the dreaded malaria, false charges brought against him by jealous rivals, the indifference of his superiors, uh, attempts on his life by the slave traders, but he refused to allow any hazard to impede his work. Appointed governor of the new nation of Liberia in 1825, Yehudi Ashman developed the country's commerce, education, and government so skillfully that he helped make it possible for Liberia to become the first independent Negro Republic in Africa. Here is a fascinating event. Well, it's all in about Isn't that amazing? And yeah. the fact that his chances are excellent, that he was tied in with Dr. William Beaumont, who was schoolmaster up there uh, in Champlain, and he was a a uh, young kid, Calvin says, 13 years old, about that time, chances are, was in, in doctor's... What you want? Just a little glare. Oh. Yeah, in Dr. Uh, Beaumont's classroom. Thank well, Beaumont would Cambridge. have been between the ages of 22 and 24, and uh, Yehudi Ashman would have been between the ages of 13 and 15, which would have put him at yeah. what today we would call a middle school age. At that period of time, the general tradition was that people were schooled up through grade eight. Yeah. And that would be pretty much the end of it. We, uh, it was a little bit later before we had a lot of academies in the North Country, so that which we, now we would call high school. 
so that it, it's quite likely that uh, the two of them knew each other. I told you, everything is connected, John. Everything is connected. <laughs> also, Beaumont, while he was there during that period of time, was secretary of the local debating society yes. up in Champlain. Yes, yes he was. I'd Another like to little know more fact. about that debating society yeah, in Champlain. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been? <laughs> what are we going to talk that, about Calvin. today? Huh? The debating society, and later on in Plattsburgh, the Lyceum, right here on the old. Oh base. yes. Oh, that's true yes. too. Yes, yes. Yeah. the Lyceum. What a deal! <laughs> that was the name of our movie theater in Champlain. The Lyceum. The Lyceum. Was it really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful stuff. It wasn't the Rialto or Rialto, the Strand. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have had a wonderful discussion today. Dr. John Southwick, Jim Dawson, Keith Herkelo. Thank you. And the fat guy in the middle. We, this has been great. I love it when we get, <laughs> sometimes it's a, it's a duet, sometimes it's a triumvirate. And this quartet will go down in history. <laughs> in flames. Uh, well, I, thank I, you, Gordy, for I, hosting this. I, yes. always, yes. I always thank our viewers because they're so insightful. They watch things like this and say, what are you guys talking about? You said... And they always uh, either correct us or compliment us, <laughs> whatever comes first. But what I used they... to call frequently and correct them, but I haven't done that lately. <laughs> <laughs> Not because you're you the star of the show, huh? Right? No, I won't. But we do, uh, if people do have memorabilia about Dr. Beaumont or anything else that we've discussed today, please call, contact one of us. Calvin is easily accessible at Hometown Cable up there in Champlain. Uh, and we always appreciate your comments and suggestions. I think you can determine, based on what we've said here today, that we all have great passion about history and the history of this wonderful area of Northeastern Amazing. New York State. Yep. This show, thanks to the miracle of the internet, is being broadcast around the world at plattsburgh.com as well as on your local cable system. So if we're going to preach the gospel, we might as well get into the hinterlands, <laughs> right? Now, Calvin... We're going to preach it. We're going to have to practice it. We are. <laughs> we have to pound the table every now and again. Wow. All right. This is... Uh, uh, you're going to end the program today with uh, an episode, episode from Medic, the Richard Boone series from what what era do we know? A long cotton picking time ago, yeah. Early long 50s. time ago. Oh, I don't yeah. think it'd be fi Is it 50s? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, right. it is the 1950s. Yes. Right. Richard okay. Boone. Uh, Holy and, and guest star Charles Bronson. As uh, a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he was a, a young guy. We all were. Oh, yeah. 1954, it says. There 1954. You go. I was only a junior in high school. 1954. I want to tell you where I John was already had already been practicing for 31 years. <laughs> Thanks. Anyways, you watch this. Think kindly of us in our old age. Best of luck to all of you gentlemen, and who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner. <laughs> Conrad Sander, Doctor of Medicine. Tonight's story has the title, Who Search for Truth. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Actual case history tonight concerns one aspect in the field of physiology. The object in point, a legal contract. It's dated October 19, 1832. It represents an agreement never duplicated in the history of man. The case in point, Alexis St. Martin, 19-year-old French-Canadian, occupation fur trapper. On the sixth day of June in the year 1822, he reached the trading post at Fort Mackinac, Michigan. Awaiting him there were money and trade goods in exchange for his furs. Also awaiting him was a most unusual destiny. Go to the hospital, get Dr. Beaumont, hurry.
Thus, in the early afternoon of June 6, 1822, William Beaumont, M.D., an obscure army surgeon pursuing his profession in the far reaches of the Michigan wilderness, strode into the crude back room of the Mackinac trading post and raised the curtain on one of the most admirable and most important dramas ever enacted in the field of medical science. And that drama is still with us today, every last detail, carefully annotated and preserved in William Beaumont's own handwriting. These are his words. This is his story, as he himself set it down. Being then stationed at the garrison on the island, I was immediately called to the relief of Alexis St. Martin. When I arrived at the place, I found him senseless and apparently in a moribund state. The shotgun charge, consisting of powder and duck shot, was received in the left side at close distance. It had blown off and fractured the sixth rib about the middle anteriorly, fractured the fifth rib, ruptured the lower portion of the left lobe of the lungs, and lacerated the stomach by a spicula of the rib that was blown through its coat. I also noted a portion of the lungs protruding through the external wound. Immediately below this, a portion of the stomach protruded. There was a puncture in this portion large enough to receive my forefinger. Alexis St. Martin. Is that correct? Yeah. Came in early this morning. They say he's from Montreal. Came down with one of the expeditions. Anyone with him? Friend or relative? No, he was alone. Oh, it's too bad. Oh, it was an accident. We're sure of that. I want him moved to the post hospital as soon as possible. I'll get a letter. Take him to the hospital. You think he still has a chance with a wound like that? I don't think he can live more than 36 hours. In the meantime, I still intend to do everything possible to keep him alive. Before moving the patient, St. Martin, I attempted to reduce the portions of the lungs and stomach which protruded from the wound. I found the lung was prevented from returning by the sharp point of the fractured rib, over which its membrane had caught fast. But by raising up the lung with the front finger of my left hand, I clipped off with my penknife and my right hand the sharp point of the rib, which enabled me to return the lung into the cavity of the thorax. After giving the wound a superficial dressing, the patient was moved to the post hospital, and in about an hour, I attended to dressing the wound more thoroughly, not supposing it probable for him to survive the operation of extracting the fractured spicula of bones and other extraneous substances. But to my utter astonishment, he bore it without a struggle or without sinking. After that, I applied over the wound a carbonated fermenting poultice, changing it once every 8, 10, or 12 hours. The desired effect was achieved in less than 84 hours with a lively reaction commencing in about 24 hours. This reaction was accompanied with strong arterial action and high inflammatory symptoms of the system generally, more especially of violent pneumonia and inflammation of the lungs. Ooh. Ooh. Me, bon dieu, the pain, oh, St. Mel, El Alexi. All right, son, lie pain. quietly. Pain. Another few minutes now, I'll let you alone. The doctor, in vain, pain, pain. I told you to lie quietly, now do as I say. I die. What priest? You was a plea. Get priest. He was here this afternoon. He'll be back again tonight. I die. I don't want death. I pray. Not here. So far away from Maria. Big trees, but the white river, oh, big, big land, my own, so far away, my family. You must play, doctor. Not dead. Not let me die. No, Alexis, your life is not all within my power. But for myself, I promise you, I won't let you die. 8th of June. The fever continues, and there has been no reaction from the bowels at all. 
Everything the patient takes into his stomach is either absorbed or makes its exit from the wound in the stomach externally. The protruded portions of the lungs and the lacerated section of the stomach have sloughed off, leaving the large puncture of the stomach plain to be seen. The patient thus far has experienced no sickness or irritability of the stomach, not even nausea. Do you know what, William? I just don't know. It's just so hard to take hold of. Imagine. By all that's right, that boy should have been dead days ago. I'm surprised as you, Deborah, but the fact remains he's very much alive. But if he's in torture, I mean, all that suffering, all the pain, half his stomach open. What reason? You know he can't live. Where life is, I try to persuade it to remain. I succeed, I fail. The final voice is never mine. But this poor boy, what possible hope is there? I don't know. The hopeful, the hopeless. It's a grave question, but it's not my field. I'm a medical doctor, not a philosopher. I'm not much of a businessman, either. There, there aren't too many that are pressing. Just three or four here. And this one. Well, and maybe this one here. And this one. It's really not too pressing. Is it, William? I love you. I love you very much. Don't you worry now. You hear? It's going to be all right. I don't think so, Deborah. And I'm not worried much. So it continued. The townspeople stood by and waited for Alexis to die. But the waiting stretched into days, weeks, then months. Alexis hung on desperately. He would not die. Dr. Beaumont examined and treated the patient daily, recording every step, every observation, down to the smallest detail. So complete, so thorough are his notes, that even today they would be a credit to the finest hospital in the world. The 27th of June. After three weeks, his appetite is now regular. The stomach has shown not the least disposition to close its puncture by granulations. The 18th of July. The sixth rib, which was worst injured and blown off entirely in the first place, has become curious or decayed at its fractured extremity. I have been obliged to amputate it about midway between sternum and spine. I did this by dissecting around, separating and retracting the intercostals to the sound portion of the rib and then sewing it off with a very narrow, short saw, which I made for the occasion. The operation succeeded admirably. To retain food and drink as much as possible, I have kept to the opening in the stomach a firm compress of lint, fitted to the shape and size of the puncture and confined by straps of adhesive. Under these dressings, digestion is as completely performed as in the most healthy person in the vicinity. I am even able to see digestion go on each time I dress the wound. After trying every means within my power to close the puncture of the stomach without the least appearance of success, I gave over trying. 28th of April. Today I have been informed by authorities of the town that they're not able nor are they required to further provide for Alexis St. Martin. He is a pauper, no friends, no money. They propose to pack him off in an open canoe to his native place, Montreal, nearly 2,000 miles distant. My protest against such inhuman disposal of a person are of no avail, even though the authorities are aware it will mean death for him. Happy are they that die in the poorhouse of this town. In my opinion, the public officers of the town would sooner pay a round sum for the extinction of a pauper than to make an exertion or take any trouble to procure the necessary assistance. Don't you think that's a bit strong, William? They really have a good excuse. They say the charity fund is low. The town just can't afford it. Alexis St. Martin's a human being. Because he lacks property doesn't make him less worthy of life than the rest of us. Oh, no, I imagine it doesn't. 
May the Lord deliver us from evil. And what greater evil could befall a human being than to become dependent on the charity of this town in time of distress? It certainly is too bad, William. I wish there was something I could do. Oh, there's something we both can do. Something we must do. We'll take him in with us. We'll give him lodging and anything else he should need. Oh, but how can we afford it, William? I don't mean to be selfish, but it means feeding him, clothing him, other things. How could we do it? You know the bills we have already. How could we do it? We must do it. No one else will. You clear out the attic. I'll move him in tomorrow morning. Yes, William. Just as you say. William Beaumont took Alexis into his own family in 1823 and remained with him almost two years. During this time, despite his salary of $40 a month, Beaumont nursed him, fed him, clothed him, furnished him with every comfort, and dressed his wounds twice a day. Then one night in the early months of 1825, suddenly, unexpectedly, the first glimmering of the grand idea came to him. When he lies on the opposite side, I can look directly into the cavity of the stomach and almost see the process of digestion. It is my observation that this case affords an excellent opportunity for the experimenting upon the gastric fluids and process of digestion. It would give no pain nor cause the least uneasiness. I may therefore be able hereafter to give some interesting experiments on these subjects. I have now found that I can pour water into the stomach with a funnel or put in food with a spoon and draw them out again with a siphon. I have frequently suspended meat and other substances into the stomach perforation to ascertain the length of time to digest each. At one time, I used a tent of raw beef instead of lint to close the opening in the stomach and found that in less than five hours it was completely digested off as if it had been cut with a knife. As the days follow, the patient becomes more discontent with his lot, not entirely without reason. All manner of digestible and indigestible objects are poked into the orifice of his stomach. He must fast for hours, lie in certain positions for long periods, and all this for the sake of medical science, in which the patient himself has not the slightest interest. Experiments began and continued in the year of 1825. The grand idea had come into being. It was only a start, a beginning, but it proved a firm foundation on which the obscure army surgeon erected his structure of incontrovertible truth. And as history will support, the final truths recognized were not easily attained. In the midst of some of Beaumont's most important experiments in late summer of the same year, Alexis St. Martin chose to embark on another of his vacations without leave. In the face of things, there was nothing the good doctor could do but wait and hope for the return of his most unreliable, yet most valuable subject. And in time, he did return. Dr. Malnami! I know you wait. I know you would be here. Ah, this room. Same old place. I know you would wait for Alexi. You say nothing. I go away, I come back, and you say nothing, you do not welcome Alexi. Where have you been? To see some friends. Friends here, there, all over I got friends. And I have good time, doctor, very good time. We sing, we drink, we dance. Alexi have big old time. You should have seen it, mon ami. You should see it. You knew I needed you. Why did you leave? Doctor, to see some friends. Something wrong? I see it all the time. What difference if I go? It makes a lot of difference. You know that. I know nothing. What do I know of these, these things that you do to me? What for I should do it? To me, it is nothing. Why? Because you agreed to, that's why. You gave me your word. Then I take back the word. No more. I do it no more. You push, you poke, 
here, there, you put things in, you take things out. For me, this is no good. Only you. You find out all about Alexei's stomach. Maybe this is what you want. This is not what I want. Then what is it? What do you want? I don't know. I do not know. This I know I do not want. Maybe it's better if you give me some money. We, oui. you give me money, I not go. That's good, no? What I give you now is all I can spare. I have no more. I have a family to raise, remember? This is no good. That's bad. Mon ami, I like you. You are smart in the head. But also, I like the money. I need it. Doctor, we are businessmen, no? To you, I sell the stomach. To me, you give the money. This is all right. You not give me money, I not stay. This is bad, no good. You give me money, I stay. No money, I go. Wait. Doctor, mon ami. Be quiet. You drunken lout. You selfish, miserable, drunken lout. I'm sick of you. You dare to come to my house in the middle of the night stinking of whiskey. Stumbling in here, bargaining and shouting at me to buy something you should be glad to give away free. Doctor. I told you to be quiet, do you hear? I don't want to hear another word from you. You have a short memory, Alexis. Do you remember moaning on a cot over at the post hospital while I stood attending you, moaning that you were dying? No death, no death. Je vous en bleu. Do not let me die, doctor. Remember that? Do you remember the days and the weeks that I took care of you every day? The weeks, the months, the years? The surgery, working night after night to find a dressing that would keep your stomach covered so that you could stay alive. Do you remember that, Alexis? Do you? All right. And what did I do after I attended you, my friend? What did I do every day after I had dressed your wounds, fed you, comforted you? Did I come to you and say, Alexis, I do not like this. I want money. We are businessmen. Either you pay or you die. Did I ever say that to you? Did I ever say that, Alexis? Did I ever say anything like that? No. All right, my friend. Then why do you say it? Why do you ask this of me? It's the money, doctor. I need the money. You've needed money ever since I met you. I gave you all the help and care and medical attention I could, but I never asked you for money. When you were put out of the hospital because you were a pauper, you couldn't pay. My wife and I, we took you into our home. Food, clothing, everything you needed. And did we come to you and say, Alexis, we want money? Either you give us money or we'll put you in a canoe for Montreal. And most likely you will die on the way. Is that what we said, Alexis? Does that sound like anything we ever said? No. Then why do you ask these things of me? Why do you ask these things of me? Alexis, it has been a long time since we first came together. Years. Time and again, I've tried to explain to you what it is I'm trying to do. I know it was difficult for you, the language, the science. But I hoped you had realized at least how much this can mean, how important it can be. Can't you see it, my friend? Can't you realize it? For the first time in medical history, day by day, we are gifted with the sight of a vital organ in action within a human body. Never has such a thing been known or seen, but it has happened. It is happening now, to us, you and me. Think of what this can mean, what we can do, what we can accomplish for everybody in the world to come. How much sickness we can prevent, disease. From what we learn from you, how much suffering, and ignorance, and death can we conquer. There are no limits, no boundaries. Your accident, this opening in your side, will make your name famous throughout the ages of man. Can't you realize this, Alexis? Alexis. Oh. 
So with things temporarily restored to normal and the inevitable hangover given expert treatment, the experiments continue. Experiments which were successfully executed almost in the depths of the wilderness, without knowledge for research or special education in the field of chemistry, without the aid and resources of shining up-to-date chrome and stainless steel laboratories, but with the most crude and primitive instruments and equipment, most of which he had to fashion with his own hands, transferred from one army community to another, from Fort Mackinac and from thence to Fort Niagara, somehow managing to persuade his prized patient Alexis to accompany him, the $40 a month army surgeon, the grand physiologist from America's backwoods, plodded on and on with his experiments. And then while at Fort Niagara, there came one fateful day late in August of 1825, and one of the neighbors saw him on the road last night. Alexis told him he was leaving you. He didn't know where he was going, but he was leaving you for good. So he was gone. Alexis, the prized patient, the reluctant, unthinking backwoodsman, who unwittingly, perhaps unwillingly, served all humanity. Beaumont was stricken, but he decided to give to the world the results of the experiments he had made, medical facts and findings, which today, as they did then, profoundly affect the lives and health of every one of us. In August of the year 1829, after four years of constant seeking and searching, Beaumont located Alexis St. Martin in Lower Canada, and after much correspondence and many promises, finally persuaded him to return to him. And Alexis did return, with children and with a wife for whom he demanded steady employment. Thus the experiments resumed where they had left off too abruptly four years before. Even though a legal contract was drawn between the two men, it made no difference to Alexis. Soon there would be the usual drunken sprees. Again, the impossible demands for more money, more luxuries, more everything. And as suddenly as before, in the early months of 1834, mon ami Alexis made his final departure into Lower Canada. The last entry was made. A chapter of American medical history had come to an end. William Beaumont never saw Alexis St. Martin again. The one-time army surgeon who rose to the heights finally settled in St. Louis, Missouri. And there on a clear spring morning, the 25th of April, 1853, his last breath was recorded. A few years later, the body of his beloved wife, Deborah, was also laid to rest. And there in modest graves, they sleep together, side by side. William Beaumont, MD, whose life work takes his place among the most important physiological experiments of his or any other age. Most of our knowledge of the human stomach today is traceable directly to detailed studies and observations of America's backwoods physiologist. Knowledge which establishes a broad foundation for the treatment of all the various disorders of the stomach, organic and functional. Knowledge which permits life-saving surgery of the stomach and abdomen, never before dreamed of. All from a crude 19th century dwelling in the backwoods of Michigan. William Beaumont, MD, 1785-1853.